Aloha. Aloha. Going to deal with a very serious subject today: gravity. There's a joke there somewhere, but it's escaping me right now. Okay, gravity. Uh, anybody watch the warning show today? Did anybody watch the warning show? They, they were talking very briefly about this presentation. I'm quite sure that this was going to be space gravity as opposed to body gravity. Anybody knows what body gravity is, please come and tell me. I don't know. Yes, space gravity is. So I covered the first three points on this as I work way through my self-introduction. The fourth bullet there is emergency response. After 9-11, I spent quite a lot of time doing original research in emergency response in case something happened in Canada. Enough said about that. Let's get into gravity. So, mass versus weight. You probably think these are synonymous. They're not. Uh, mass is something that doesn't change, but weight does change. Weight very much depends on where you are in the universe. Uh, even where you are on the planet, actually. Your weight will change very slightly depending where you are on the planet because uh, your weight is the force exerted on you from gravity standing on the surface of the Earth. Uh, I won't go into that equation there because we'll deal more about that in a minute. Yes, so here are the planets. Mercury, Venus, the Moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and underneath there, you see those numbers, that's going to be your weight on the surface of the planet. Now, admittedly, being on the surface of Jupiter is going to be difficult because it's a gas giant. And indeed, if you were standing sort of on the titular surface of Jupiter, you'd be in for a very long fall down to the unknown center of that planet. But you would be weighing there a little over 330 pounds or kilos. If you want to lose weight rapidly, if you've been to the buffet too often, then go to the moon because your weight there will drop to 23 pounds or 23 kilos. So that's a really quick way to lose weight. But of course your mass is going to stay the same. This is a gravitational map of the Earth. And the way this is portrayed to you is if the Earth was a perfect sphere, then the gravity would be completely constant all over the surface of the Earth. So what you're looking at now is the deviations on the surface of the Earth compared to a perfect sphere. Really, the message to take away from this is that gravity does change over the surface of the Earth because the Earth is not a perfect sphere. If you happen to be on top of a mountain, for example, there's more mass underneath you. If you happen to be at the bottom of the sea, uh, there's less mass underneath you. And so uh, the gravity is a little bit less there. Of course, being at the bottom of the sea, the pressure in the water is going to allow you to stick around very long. So how did we come up with, with gravity? Well, we go back to Aristotle. And as I'll tell you in the history of astronomy, the Greeks were fundamental in giving us a foundation for science in general and in astronomy. Uh, the problem with the Greek thinking is often they would start with a premise that was obvious to them and then build theories on top of that that substantiated with whatever observations they made. Sometimes their obvious conclusions were incorrect. Aristotle was well known for this, although he is very famous and he did some very good ones, good theories, he was incorrect with this one. So, he is correct, there is no motion without a cause. But, he then concluded that the speed of a falling object is proportional to the weight of the object. And uh, it also depends on the medium that it's going through. Now his theory, his fundamental theory, which influenced this scientific thinking, lasted for 1700 years, which is a long time to be not quite right. There was a couple of other thinkers in the past that mentioned gravity. Uh, St. Hildegard of Bingham, she was a, a nun. Uh, she actually came up with the concept of gravity just around the turn of the uh, first century, first millennium AD. Uh, of course, nobody was listening. Copernicus also measure, mentions gravity, but he has no idea what gravity is. So there's no development of theory in the Copernican model. Well, with my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. But I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of the gentleman named Galileo a long time ago, who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that... Uh, Uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happened. 
Thumbs in the right hand, thumbs in the left hand. All right, warning. <laughs> Formula ahead. Uh, if the person sitting next to you seems to glaze over, uh, it's probably because of the formula that are going to come up here. I'm not going to dwell on the formula, but it is necessary just to illustrate some of the things I want to say. So here, you've been warned. All right, so those are the two fundamental equations that we need to deal with. Over on the left is Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. And over on the right is Newton's law of gravitation. By the way, uh, despite the fact that still does a very good job, it's been su superseded by another theory of gravity. You, know, you could still use Newton's law, but it is actually not quite correct. It is Einstein's theory of gravity that is correct and needed for some calculations. So the force exerted on an object, which is a planet, uh, is the same on both the left and right equations there. So you can equate the mass times the acceleration to that nasty thing over on the right. And so the acceleration simply now equals the gravitational constant, it's a constant, times the mass of the planet uh, divided by the distance you are away from the planet squared. And we normally replace that acceleration with the familiar g term, which is the acceleration due to gravity. The fact constant g can be measured in the laboratory. And this is the famous Cavendish experiment. It was done in 1797. Let me just describe to you very briefly what is going on here. We have two large masses, left and right, of a torsion balance. The torsion balance is in the middle. So what is happening is the two very large spheres are attracting the two small spheres, gravitational attraction. They are twisting, and that amount of twist is measured on the torsion balance. And from this out comes the gravitational constant. It's interesting, though, that when Cavendish was doing this, he was actually trying to measure something else. So this is the actual value for G, the gravitational constant. Uh, it is in SI units, but it is a very small number, of you can see there, 10 to the minus 11. And I put it out in conventional uh, notation, so you can see just how many zeros there are in front of the significant digits. So if I had two objects that were a meter apart, that weighed about a kilogram or two pounds, then the force one is exerting on the other is given by that very small number underneath, which I'm not gonna read out because there's too many zeros. But rather to put things in a little bit more perspective for you, you see the two elephants on the lower left. Well, they're exerting a force of about 0 0.01 newtons on each other. So that's why they're, they're together like that because the gravity has drawn them together. <laughs> you didn't believe that, did you? No, right. Just checking. Right. Now, I want to explain to you what you're going to see here. This is a video clip. Uh, this is an elapsed time of seven minutes, and it's been speeded up. You will see there are two large silver balls standing on rectangular blocks. A hand will come into the video and will move them to the other end of the block. There is a polystyrene uh, small rectangle there that is suspended from above by a very thin filament. And on the end of that, there are two lead weights. Uh, you can see the two lead weights. Right now, they're next to the two silver spheres. What you will see then is when the two larger silver spheres are moved to the other end of the blocks, the gravitational influence they exert on the lead weights will move that little platform that the lead weights are, are resting on. Those balls are 750 grams, and the lead is 340 grams. And here it goes. It's the hand. That's the gravitational attraction from the spheres on the lead weights taken in an enterprising amateur scientist's basement. So there you've actually seen gravity in action. I think that's a wonderful demonstration. Then along comes Einstein 
And Einstein basically uh, extends Newton's law of gravitation to explain some things. Uh, essentially, Einstein's theory, although it is mathematical and it is very complex, I think anybody who has done any high school mathematics can deal with Newton's law of gravitation without too much difficulty of, uh, at all. Einstein, on the other hand, you need some very advanced mathematical techniques to deal with the equations that he developed. But nonetheless, you can still get some flavor of what he's saying. And he's saying there that gravity is due to the curvature of space-time. Space-time is curved by mass, so it alters the shape. And in the picture, you see the, the Earth and the Moon there with the indentations underneath them. That plane is meant to represent space-time. This is one of the predictions from the general relativity. When you look next to the sun into the, the sky beyond it, you see a star. You think it's in a particular position. That is the position shown on the diagram here saying observed star. So you think it's there. But, in fact, it's not. It is over to the left. Why? because the light that has passed next to the sun has actually been altered, the course of the light has been altered by the gravitational power of the sun, by the curvature in the space-time. So while the photon itself is a massless, chargeless particle, and, and really you can't alter it by the electrical magnetic forces, the fact that it is now traveling in not a straight line, its course has been changed. This was tested during a solar eclipse by Arthur Eddington. And it was this result that was published in newspapers around the world that made Einstein a household name, literally overnight. The, the theory, this theory of general relativity, which had been tested experimentally, made him famous everywhere. And I will be talking more about this when we discuss Albert Einstein's life. So yes, this has been confirmed. Light is bent by gravity. So if you want to live longer, go down into the basement, and after 79 years, you will have lived 90 billionths of a second longer. Right. No. This is a really interesting concept. It's too bad nobody's actually done this. I've seen this in a movie, uh, and I was trying to remember the name of the movie. It, it's a remake. Total Recall. That's it. It's in Total Recall. There's a gravity train that goes through the center of the planet. Well, going through the center is another issue because it's a molten core. But you could go uh, on the side of the planet. In that lower left diagram, you could see that you could go from different places. Now, to go from any place to any place using a gravity train, amazingly, it takes 42 minutes. The maximum speed there, as you can see, is about 8,000 meters per second. And the trek time only depends on the density of the planet and the gravitational constant. It would be a major, a major engineering feat to be able to do that, but a gravity train would be a great way to get around. We wouldn't have to fly. So, what is gravity? Is it a graviton? Is it curved space-time? Or is it something that comes out of string theory? And I didn't really touch on string theory, String theory is something that has been developed over the last few decades and is still developing. In fact, one part of string theory, now known as M-theory, is being used to perhaps give us a better understanding of what happened at the beginning of our universe. I'll talk more about that when we talk about the universe. But basically, we don't know is a mystery, exactly what this force is that's keeping us where we are, keeping everything in its place in the universe, in our solar system, what's causing the life cycle of stars and the death of stars, what a strange and miraculous force gravity is, and I would really love to know what it is. And that brings me to the end of gravity. We have five minutes. I can take a couple of questions if anybody is 
earning to know or grab